look, man, I didn't I didn't mean to shoot the son of a bitch. The gun went off. I don't know why. Get the fuck out my face with that shit. The motherfucker said that shit never had to pick up any bitty pieces of skull on account of your dumb ass. I got a threshold, Jules. I got a threshold for the abuse that I would take. Now, I'm right now I'm a fucking race car, right? And you got me in a red. Well, I'm a mushroom cloud laying motherfucker, motherfucker. Every time my fingers touch brain, I'm super fly TNT. I'm the guns of the Navarone. <laughs> I want to win. I want that trophy. So dad's good. All right, let's see what you can do. Take it away. It was a teenage wedding and the old folks wished him well. You could see that Pierre did truly love the mademoiselle. And now the young monsieur and madame have run the chapel. We have to give. C'est la vie, c'est the old folks. It goes to show you never. Motorcycle, baby, it's a chopper. Five long years he wore this watch up his ass. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Yeah. Print it. That's a wrap. I'm gonna go to the bathroom and powder my nose. So I'm Mark Critty and I am a pinball designer and I've been working with Play Mechanics and Raw Thrills for the last 16 years um, and um, I made Pulp Fiction. <laughs> I'm back. When the licensing became available it, and it was brought to me basically, hey would you want to do a pinball based around Pulp Fiction? You know, my immediate response was, well, it's been 26 years since I've touched the pinball machine, but absolutely, yes. <laughs> Hell yeah. My name is George Petro, and I am president of Play Mechanics Incorporated. We make video games and now pinball machines. And by the way, I programmed this one behind me. Pinball's back, obviously, and we're old pinball guys. We used to do this a long time ago for a company called Williams Electronics, if anybody remembers them. Um, Mark and I met over a pinball machine, and I actually got hired at Williams over a pinball machine, so I'm just, uh, I'm an old pinball guy. My name is Josh Sharp, and I am the rules designer for Pulp Fiction Pinball. So this project, as far as my involvement, was interesting. So by day, I'm the chief financial officer at Raw Thrills. By night, I'm a crazy pinball person. and. I do our project costs month to month for Raw Thrills and notice that there was this project called PF that was starting to show up on our project list. And I remember talking to Eugene about like, do you have any idea what the hell this is? And he had mentioned just like flip it that like Mark was playing around with something pinball related. And I was like, what? Like it, I was, it was crazy. I'm Doug Duba with Chicago Gaming. I was involved with the development of Pulp Fiction, and we will be manufacturing and distributing the product. So Mark Ritchie had contacted me indicating they were working on a project. He came out, and in the beginning, I didn't know where it was gonna go. We helped them with some parts and initially prototyping some play fields, and you know, really kind of fell in love with the project and became more and more involved as time went on. I'm Scott Pakulski. I was the graphic designer on Pulp Fiction Pinball. I did all the art uh, package on the whole game. So the theme of the game is Pulp Fiction, but it's also a tribute to 70s pinball, too. Hi, I'm David Thiel. Over the last 40 years, I've gradually become a pinball audio artist, and I'm excited to tell you about the best audio package I've done so far, which is uh, for Pulp Fiction. This. I've seen the movie. I love the movie. I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a, a genre changer. It, Tarantino brings dialogue back to movies. I loved it. So to be dumped into a group where everybody knew what they were doing. Uh, Mark, of course, and George is world class. 
and Josh is, uh, well, he has pedigree and he really knows, he's been working with a lot of people, he knows what, what's up. And the rest of the team, the artists, Scott, I mean, they're all, all very impressive. This is gonna be great. One of the really interesting things that occurred on this project was that we had absolute buy-in from Quentin Tarantino, from the ground up. Basically wanted us to create a pinball machine that looked like it came from late 70s, 1980s. And that's what we did. So this project started because Quentin Tarantino wanted a pinball machine. And specifically, he wanted a 70s style pinball machine. When we first started talking with him about what we were going to design, we obviously brought him up to the state of art of pinball at the time, which you know involves LCD panels. Pinballs look a lot different than they did in the 70s. He didn't want any of that. In fact, I have a, a folder of machine reference he sent us that some were dated back to like the 60s, but mostly it was in that 70s realm pinball. Yeah, so dealing with Pulp Fiction as a property. Um, you know, from my perspective, we've dealt with some pretty large properties. Um, we've dealt with the Terminator franchise, with Jurassic Park. We feel like we're really good at that part. We were very comfortable working with the property and very confident that we could do something that would be honoring to it. You know, we're working directly with Miramax, who didn't really have a department for license out, so we're kind of floating around. Um, eventually, we got handed right to Quentin Tarantino's uh, right-hand person, so we had a direct connect there. And often, I would, when we were trying to get things in for approval, Quentin Tarantino, it turns out, doesn't carry a cell phone, and he pretty much has an answering machine that you know to get a hold of him some pe people can get a hold of him but i would get like a text message that would be okay send the renders to this address right now you know send them mail them to this address he's there for two more days and then he can see it and you know so we kind of had to jump through a bunch of hoops but it, it really wasn't bad they've been very very good about it making pulp fiction was could be challenging at times regarding the license itself because my goal was to try to pay as much homage to the movie as possible, obviously. But the, the most thing is the respect that we had for the actors and for all the stuff that basically makes that game what it is. I guess my biggest concern was just paying attention, close attention to when those speech calls were called and, and how much attention was brought to the characters, the briefcase. I mean, we had respect for all the assets. I guess the most challenging part of that would have been putting all that together because there are so many leaps and bounds that that movie takes. Pulp Fiction, it's such an interesting movie and you know Quentin Tarantino in general is awesome. The ability for us to play around in his world, he has such th these large worlds and the ability for us to play around with it just ended up naturally working really well for pinball where it is this chaotic mess and you're, you're dancing around everywhere and you're leading into this one feature, but then you're starting something totally unrelated. And then you're coming back to the thing that you had lit, but you didn't consummate earlier. And I feel like it just, it, it overlays with kind of how the, the movie works as well. That's how we really got started in that, in that realm. And it was a big challenge because he was very specific about things he wanted. So one of the quick details that he got involved in was the back glass. Right, the original back glass for the game was the iconic movie poster of Mia on the bed, you know, reading the book. Well, he was like, no way. We, we sent that to him, he's like, I hate it. He goes, do you want me to have my artist do a back glass for you? And of course, you could have Scott tell the story, but Scott was like, no, I'll handle it. So Scott came up with a very, we did a lot of research on what, you know, some of our favorite glasses from the 70s and how they, you know, focused on a center character and how all the people were around them. And that's where Scott got the idea of, hey, I could put all the characters in Jackrabbit Slims and then, you know, they could all be focused on Mia dancing. And he absolutely, um, he, Quentin Tarantino, absolutely loved it. When we sent it to him, he goes, that's it right there. So very involved in all the design decisions that we were making, saw, you know, we did early renderings, we did pictures, we, we shot video of the game and everything. To, to show him every step of the way. The game switched from being a Pulp Fiction art package to a vintage pinball theme that just so happened to be Pulp Fiction. So it could sit next to other vintage pinball machines that had themes that weren't licensed, but this one just happens to be Pulp Fiction. So yeah, the, the 70s theme 
The vintage theme is what I really tried to hammer in, and then the Pulp Fiction laid on top of that. So once I took uh, Pulp Fiction uh, graphics and stuff, and, and it kind of filtered it through a 70s pinball lens, then I knew I was nailing it, because uh, then he really loved it. So Pulp Fiction's a weird movie. It has, uh, if you look at it, you would probably say it's a 70s movie. Like when I look at it, I go, you know, they're wearing these suits, the, you know, the uh, Sam Jackson's hair, John, Tr you know, everything speaks 70s, the cars, everything, but they have cell phones. So it's kind of like, okay, it's not really 70s, is it? So that's how we kind of went about this game. This game's gonna be, look like it's from the 70s, but we're gonna put things in it that are very not 70s. Things that are, could only happen now and be part of the current pinball scene. So that's the basis of the game. And then bringing it up from there, we wanted to make it look everything Pulp Fiction. So as we started to put it together, you know, we really looked at every piece and said, okay, how does this, how does this match the movie? How does this, you know, speak to the movie? It really, you look at it, it looks 70s, but it's not, you know, and that's kind of the, that was our mantra through the whole thing. When you approach it, it's going to look retro. The displays are going to say retro. But, you know, those displays, you can't buy gas discharge anymore. They look gas discharge. Those are completely tooled out of LED to look just like the gas discharge display. So we, you know, we put that kind of love into it. We have a, I, I'd say the pinnacle thing on the, on the game is the briefcase, right? So when the briefcase opens, um, you saw it yourself. When the briefcase opens, it's magical. What's in the briefcase, we don't know. Nobody knows, and that is, that is the pivotal part of the movie. When that happens and you get briefcase multiball, it's amazing. The whole trick with how it looks like it's in the briefcase is, is a modern thing, right? You wouldn't find that from a vertical up kicker. You would not find that in a 70s pinball. You wouldn't find the subway in the pawn shop. Pawn shop was in the basement. The game goes in the basement. Um, those kind of things are very new. So even though we don't have a lot of levels on top of the play field, we have, we have levels behind, we have levels underneath. So um, there's a lot of interest there. And we do, some, uh, we do some fun stuff with the magnet that you know, just through experimentation that we, we all are excited about. Um, you know, we have, a, we have the Royale with cheese. Who doesn't want that? I mean, you know, we've really gone above and beyond. There's sculptures of Vincent and Jules. I mean, Jules is pointing a gun right at you. So it's, it's just incredibly realistic. And then of course, to top it all off, it's complete LED lighting with RGB, RGB GI that does, I mean, again, when you approach the machine, it's going to look like a normal machine. When it gets into its modes, it completely changes. And all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at just a, a very modern experience. You know, I don't know if too many people know this, but George Pizzaro was the programmer on one of my early pinball games. Uh, that game was Road Kings. And we worked together on that, brought some new stuff. You know, George was a junior programmer then, and kind of his first step in the game development, one of them. But we got together and became friends. Now we're talking, we're talking at least 35, 36 years ago. So we have a history. And when this came up, we both looked at each other and said, how in the fuck are we going to get this done? Because George is the president of this company and operates it very efficiently. For him to take the time to program and, and jump in this thing was awesome. It was just an awesome experience all the way around. I think that that movie is so unique in its own way regarding what you're paying attention to, meaning everything and anything constantly all the time. That's one of the things that I really got excited about because I knew the movie and I knew that it would lend itself very well to almost any kind of pinball action. The biggest things I takeaways for me regarding developing that in the pinball, first of all, the case, two big things, the case and the characters. Those two things, I think, carried most of the game. And that's what you have at the end of the day. You know, I'd say surprisingly, this game has many more LEDs than any game we've produced. It has as many or more coils, motors, and mechs than any game we've produced. It, much of it is a bit hidden. I would say the first feature I built on the game was the briefcase. You know, the fact that, oh, it's in the case, nobody knows what's in the case ever. 
there's all kinds of theories that, you know, Ving Rhames, Band-Aid, the one that he had on the back of his neck is in the case. Okay, there's a vuck to the briefcase that sends it up all up a wire form behind the back panel and then hides behind the briefcase. When you lock a ball, the briefcase will rotate and out comes the gold, the yellowish gold light right in John Travolta's face which is right out of the movie, obviously. But we were able to create an effect. You think you're locking the balls in the case. I mean, it, it's super cool. As you make progress towards briefcase boogie, you know, you're locking your first ball and you realize, holy shit, that briefcase moves and it opens and it lights. Like, what is, what is going on? And you lock your second ball and you're seeing the displays are showing the, the, the case is being solved and you, you hopefully are... Oh, I see. The three locks are the three sixes for the briefcase. We're going to open it up and we're probably going to do something special. And, you know, the answer to that is for us, the challenge is, yes, it better be special because this is this is a moment. This is a moment to hit home with. And locking that third ball, getting Jungle Boogie to start playing and to see the briefcase start to dance, the lights are going. Like, how can you not feel great about what you just did? The other thing that I worried a lot about was the pawn shop because that's where the GIMP stuff happens. We had to put the pawn shop in the game, which became a subway, which made sense because it was down below the play field. Ball comes back out. Great place to do multi-ball. The rules of, of that multi-ball is you're playing the story of some really X-rated stuff that's happening down there. But when you are locking balls, it's beginning to tell you that story. And you kind of know like, oh, we're, we're heading there, aren't we? And it's like, oh yeah, we're heading there. And you get into the multi-ball and you're playing these levels and you're advancing through the scene. And there's a stage in that multi-ball where you're relocking balls and making sure you have these trigger moments where as you're doing something important, the game is recognizing and telling you, yeah, no, I know you just did something important. I'm gonna pay you off here with some stuff that's gonna make the endorphins start flying around in your soul. Like, that's pinball, man, at its core. So those two things, I think, were the, were the, the big inspiration, the, the first things I had in the game that I knew I wanted to do. The roll scene modes are very interesting because they're actually pieces of the movie that we cut up and dropped in, such as the gold watch. Another thing that I really like is the is the instant play field multiplier shot that we've, we call it the big kahuna bonus. You hit two targets up near the bumpers, which can happen fairly randomly, but also there are shots. There are tough shots, but they can be made. And then you shoot the ball instantly into this magnet that grabs the ball. But the best part is you don't know where the ball is gonna go when it comes off the magnet. We don't just send it back down the right return lane. It can go anywhere, it can complete shots, it can lock the ball, it can knock down targets. It's, uh, it's crazy. Characters, the burger, they're interactive with the play field. We have flashers that when they speak, that light them up and you basically get to see the character speaking to you as you're playing the game. The inline drop targets also came very early in the game, but the coolest part of that is you, it creates like an intrigue, like what's behind the targets, how do I get there? The other thing is you have control that it helps us to sort of increase difficulty in the game rules regarding locking of the balls in the briefcase. But let's face it, drop targets are just fun to shoot no matter what. I love them. Um, we also have them, a three bank in front of the pawn shop. That involves not only the advancement of the, of the pawn shop, but also the Pulp Fiction spell out right in the center of the play field which those targets have everything to do with that. And, and as you're playing, you're constantly building that up. So there's that spell out. When you get to that, basically Pulp Fiction frenzy, which is, I'm not gonna tell you what the multi-ball does. You have to come play it. But for me, the biggest challenge was, a lot of it was problem solving of making sure we had rules that we could convey in the medium that we had available to convey. Making sure that cohesive package that everyone on this team has talked about that the rules fell in line with the decision to have the stainless steel coin door, the decision to you know have a mirrored back glass. For me, it was making sure the rules of the game also supported that team vision of, of the game overall. Let's talk about the rules a little bit. The last pinball that I programmed was in 1986. We were always into the rules back then. Fast forward to now, I couldn't tell you where we're at with pinball and how deep it is. And thank God Josh Sharp was on board because Josh is, the rule man, he wrote every rule in this game. Him and Mark worked through what I think we're, we're on pretty much, pretty much rules 3.0. Their experience with pinball is from this generation ago. 
and pinball is something that has stayed current with me throughout the time that they have stopped working in it. And my experience of like helping helping other design teams just on the side, you know, at night for fun, whether it's it's the guys at Stern or American Pinball or anyone in the industry, it's it's been a passion of mine and on the rules side especially, being able to to understand modern pinball rules and at least for me personally, some people may disagree, but where some of the modern rules design has gone wrong and moved from an area of that like classic Williams Bally entertainment and story first rules geeking out second. I feel like there's been a little bit of an inverse of that lately. When you look at modern pinball, it's, you know, getting excited about how many different things you can stack together and how many decimals of a multiplier that you can get for a given shot. So you notice the game from a distance and it's 1970s. You get these warm and fuzzy vibes of an era that has gone by sort of like Pulp Fiction the movie and then you take a deeper look and I think every facet of this game is you take that deeper look and there's layers here that go beyond 1977 intro to solid state gameplay and it was important for me and the rules design to also make sure that we aren't selling to an audience in the 1970s we're selling to modern pinball audience today and the game with the rules had to have those layers of depth and breadth of content because these games are now in people's basements for 10, 20 years. So it was important for me to make sure that we're hitting those notes of approachability, easy to understand. But as you get into features, you know, it's, it's like an onion. There's layers here. There's reasons for a player to want to avoid doing something now, even though they could, because there's scoring strategies throughout the game for those that care about that part of the game, that they can focus on that. There's other people where it comes strictly to content within the game that they want to explore. Everything that we've put into the game, you can drill deep into that, just that one feature alone, hammer that feature all day, and there will be enough content there to entertain you. It was really fun for me because this is a chance for me to just be the programmer and you know have somebody that really knows the rules be really um, focused on them and then for me to understand so it's really brought me up uh, to where pinball is and kind of like wow this is pinball is really fun you know like the rules these days are deep and confusing but it's actually got me more interested in where where things are at with um, pinball so this game has i mean there's so much depth behind every multi-ball and the levels you need to get to to qualify it. And then we have, of course, modes that leads to, we'll call it wizard mode, but in this game it's called divine intervention. And I can say it took Josh, I'm going to say, a good year plus to actually get it on his own. So for me, it's very important using using playfield artwork to explain the roadmap of the game that a player is about to, be play, to play to me is of paramount importance. I think if you don't have that, how can you expect a player to understand where they're, what tunnels they're digging into, where are they going, where's it taking me next? So to get to Divine Intervention are the five inserts that are above that Divine Intervention insert, which are Briefcase Boogie, which is a super jackpot in the Briefcase Multiball, Pawn Shop Panic, which is a super jackpot in the Pawn Shop Multiball, completing all of the roll scene modes, which there's a mini wizard mode for that called the shot. So playing the shot gets you that objective. There is Pulp Fiction Frenzy, which is completing all of the Pulp Fiction letters on the playfield, which is done by the arrow targets that are on the bottom third of the playfield. And then Cast Chaos, it's what I call like taxi 2.0 rules, where we have five characters and you have to start each character and collect each character to get to that mini wizard mode. A rule is a rule, and I've talked about this forever. Like, most of my favorite rules in pinball, the rule itself is stupid, but the choreography and the emotion that you are able to connect with the player on makes the rule special. I dare say it's pinball, mo it's moment makers. We're, we're moment makers here. Like when you hit that magnet and you hear that thump of the magnet grabbing the ball and 
all the, the effects that David Thiel is adding to the shot you just made, the lighting that George is passing through to make sure that like, you need to feel a certain sense of accomplishment. And if you did something important, the game needs to tell you, you just did something really fucking important, man. Like, bam, here you go, and you feel great. The conversations that I've had with, with the team, and especially with working with Mark, most of the feedback that we have, the rules are really the, the foundation of the house, but everything that you build on that, you know, the ways to connect to the player emotionally, that's all, I think, what when I first started working on the project, George calls it the frosting on the cake. That, you know, the cake is, is whatever, yellow cake, right? It is what it is. It's what you do on top of that that can make it extraordinary. And it's all of that attention to detail that I think we do really well on Pulp Fiction to make sure that the player understands what they're doing, they're having a fun time along the way, and they're feeling rewarded as they hit various accomplishments in the game. There will be two models, the Special Edition and the Bad Mother Flipper Limited Edition. The Bad Mother Flipper Limited Edition includes the topper, mirror blades, speaker grill, the LE diecast medallion, shaker motor, and the extended warranty. Bad motherfucker wallet. Only we're not calling it the bad motherfucker. We are calling it the bad mother flipper wallet. So for the LE model, we have built this amazing topper. Uh, it sports two individual motors, and basically we have the characters dancing on top of the uh, back box at uh, any given time. A lot of the music, background music, we have synced and timed to the actual movement of the characters, the lights, the flashing. I mean, this, that was a brainchild of myself, uh, Scott, and Doug Duba. So that was a, a triple action, let's do this, you know, kind of thing. And Doug is just crazy enough to listen to me and Scott. <laughs> Mark Ritchie had a concept solid concept for a topper and provided me some Photoshop renderings. I've done a few toppers, so I took on the responsibility to engineer and design the topper. I guess the biggest challenge was there are four rota molds and two of which are human, which is more difficult to do than just a typical geometric object. Basically, both characters rota rotate independently the, uh, there's a, a large amount of outputs on this, including the star field, the tricolor neon, the car headlights, and a bunch of other lighting. I, I, I think it's the most beautiful topper we've done to date, and as well, the Play Mechanics team did a great job integrating it into the gameplay. So you see actually actual motion in the characters relating to what's happening on the play field. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic topper. You know, I mean, certainly this ca this cabinet is more challenging than what we normally produce. There are quite a few extra parts in the neck and the back box. But all in all, we've been making pinball machine cabinets since 1977, so not an issue. Just more 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 parts. I saw the first prototype cabinet with artwork on it. To me, it felt like the modern Suzo Hap coin door was out of place, and. So we set out to design a new door that's very reminiscent of the old Williams Valley coin doors from that era. You know, the coin door was a lot of effort and kind of a ridiculous endeavor. I, I think it really helps the package. I think it's beautiful. We had to, you know, redesign the door. We had to tool up all the die cast parts and really search for a supplier that could produce a high quality chrome to give it a high end look. In Pulp Fiction, the dialogue, I think, is one of the biggest things in that movie. Um, obviously, not for everyone's ears, but incredibly hilarious, incredibly entertaining, um, nonstop. I mean, we'd have nonstop fun with that. The number one thing I love is the sound calls. I think Pulp Fiction is one of those movies that has every lines of sound call, and to, to hear them, it makes me laugh every time I play the game, even if I've heard it a hundred times. So Pulp Fiction sports another really cool thing, and that is we have over 300 speech calls in this game. So everything you loved about Pulp Fiction, I guarantee you, you will find in this game. Well, we got to talk about the callouts because no matter what I do, however good my pinball audio artistry is, 
The only thing anybody ever wants to talk about are the call-outs. So let's talk about the call-outs. Uh, we had the entire vocal stem for the movie, so we could pretty much pull anything that was pullable. Everyone that we pulled is being used in a most appropriate way in, in that place that that tickles that part of your that pulp fiction part of your brain. You know all those things that you've seen the movie and you want to hear them say. The game's going to say that. You like bad words? We got them. Favorite call up. So there's a story here that makes this my favorite call out, and it happened two days ago, which is great. So my three-year-old son, Evan, is like the unofficial game tester for Pulp Fiction. He plays it too many hours a day, probably more hours than I could admit that would make myself a really bad parent. So, you know, he plays all the time. George just gave me the latest software dump, and my game at home is bleeped by default because I don't know if you've, you've seen the game, but there's plenty of colorful language in it. So no swears in my house, it's fine. So David Thiel had added some speech calls to the game that may have not had their bleeped versions done yet. And by may not, they did not. So I get a FaceTime call from my wife two days ago with this really awkward look on her face. And she turns the phone to my son who said, He's a bitch. And I was like, okay. And I still had no context of like, all right, what is, what is my wife telling him at home? So my wife, Amanda, explains to me that the game is now swearing downstairs. And I was like, oh, like, and my first thought was, is there a bug that all of the beep speech is not working? Or So I'm trying to talk her through this like, so I can get some information to George, to, George to, to determine whether this is a bug or something else. And like my wife is clearly not participating at the level that I want to. But one of the speech calls happened to be, and it is now my favorite one, is, does he look like a bitch? So now my three-year-old hears that still, because it hasn't been fixed yet. So right now he's playing the game today. He's continuing to hear that. Does he look like and, a bitch? Uh, it's obviously clicked into his mind some of the more colorful language. Uh, That's my favorite call out. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Do you know what it is they call a quarter pounder with cheese in France? A royale with cheese. That's a fucking good milkshake. <laughs> That's my favorite. It's 20 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorites. Pinball, motherfucker, do you play it? <laughs> oh my God. There's a closer right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> we got the music. Yeah, yeah we, we licensed uh, original tunes from the movie Miserloo. We have Comanche, we have Jungle Boogie. You know, we have what never can tell. We have so many things um, that evoke the movie and that play out through the movie. And we also have a lot of custom music that was written by Dave Thiel, which is amazing as well. So not only is it Pulp Fiction speech and all these things, then you've got this really great custom sound package that again, evokes pinball of old, you know, where a lot of love was put into every sound effect and what it's doing and how it sounds and you know, how everything matches it. Um, having the canonical music piece, the part that reaches back into your brain and screams Pulp Fiction when you hear it, well, you know, you've got Miserloo. <laughs> right, when you have that and you hear that, you know, nobody, I, I actually looked up the history of that tune. That's an old tune. That's from like, it's actually from Turkey. It was like a, some kind of traditional tune. And then Harry James, a very famous trumpet player, had a big band popular hit of Miserloo in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. And the Dick Dale thing, that weird, you know, the very fast picking stuff, in some way it is an attempt for him to mimic the wide vibrato that Harry James had when he had the hit with Miserloo 15 years earlier. So, you know, Miserloo is, is a classic, and they've got it, and, you know, of course we use it. Miserloo's great. Then Comanche. Uh, 
which everything is associated with the scene in the pawn shop, that's another bam Tarantino thing. I mean, there's sort of a class in music assets now called the Tarantino class, which is all this stuff that he's licensed for his movies. And it kind of is like that surf music, late 50s, early 60s stuff. And then the contrast of those to Jungle Boogie. Get down. Is, is so perfect for a multi-ball because you've been in that space and then you start multi-ball and George has some fantastic lighting choreography uh, that, that that thing happens and all of a sudden you're in that other place in the movie and it's discontinuous like the movie is, right? You time trip in Pulp Fiction and so we ended up using the Dusty Springfield for Game Over. Then he look into my eyes Lord knows to my surprise The only one who could ever reach me Was the son of a preacher man Because that just seems so wonderfully appropriate. Though, in a very demented way, if you get to the, the shot thing where you're trying to help Mia out because she's passed out on the floor, there's a, a very demented heartbeat thing with hints I've, I've, I've interspersed little distorted bits of Dusty Springfield throughout that as a, you know, because it's like Mia's thing, right? Oh, and then of course, the, the most famous scene from the movie, the, the twist scene with uh, uh, you know, Chuck Berry. And, and that's such a great song. The Cooler Raider. Come on. Come on, Chuck. Cooler Raider? Perfect. This runs on the CG, CGC system, which is, uh, you know, Doug's been making Williams games for a number of years. And Williams was never a stereo. Well, I can, it was not never. They made a few stereo games, but the majority of their games are mono. Yet there are speakers in the back box and there's a speaker in the cabinet. Let me disabuse you. That's not a subwoofer. You can call it a subwoofer all day. But what CGC does is novel. Because they can, in modern times, they run a stereo system. I've optimized particularly the music, but a lot of the sound effects, so that I do something that's way beyond what would normally be like a crossover. And I can do things to the signal that's going to the cabinet speaker and I can hit its sweet spot. And, and Doug buys a pretty good cabinet speaker. If you adjust the signal properly, you can make that puppy vibrate the glass, vibrate the cabinet, vibrate the floor. And if you do that at the right time, you know, with music or a sound effect or something, that moves it into a new regime. It moves it into a psychokinetic regime where you're feeling this stuff. A degree of punch which you won't find in most production pinball machines. This is the thing for which I'm most proud now. Yeah, that's a great question. How did we come to work with CGC? So um, I mentioned that we're old time pinball guys. I have a very, um, I have a very specific way I like the mechanisms in pinball machines. I don't necessarily like the direction some companies have gone with the mechanisms and maybe cost reducing some things, you know, just taking quality out of the game. I always thought Williams was, for me, was the pinnacle, certainly by the 90s, they were the pinnacle of quality. And I really, um, I really had a lot of respect for all the people that worked there and created all of that stuff. And I had seen where Doug was, you know, Doug had started doing the remakes. Like I remember being at a trade show and he had the top up and he's showing me everything they did. And I'm like, man, this is amazing. It's amazing the lengths that CGC went to, to recreate a machine that when you play it feels like a 90s Williams machine, which let's face it, machines were moving by the, you know, 2010 machines had moved far away from that. So I recognize that, but put that aside, 
when we were deciding to do this, you know, we started having to investigate hardware. Like I'm like, okay, what, what computer are we gonna use? I'm not putting a PC in there, it's too, too overpowered. We need a good system, solid system. I started looking around at what people were using. You know, you had these different, uh, obviously Multimorphic has a system, there's a Heber system, there's all these different systems. And I kind of zeroed in on a certain CPU and I noticed that CGC was using the same CPU and I was like, oh, let me, let me check this out a little further. And I, you know, Attack from Mars has the schematics in it. So I started looking at it and I'm like, oh, this is really, this is really clever. You know, how they've taken this and, and made it something that mimics what a Williams pinball is doing. The collaboration has been amazing because, you know, yes, it's play mechanics designed. Yes, we're doing, you know, everything here for that part, but CGC has been absolutely 100% on board with trying to create everything that we wanted to create. Like, how do we build this? How do we tool this? The things that we have on this game, really, we would not have if, if Doug wasn't, I believe, if Doug wasn't involved, we would not have half the things, especially that topper. The topper is amazing. That's his thing. Um, you know, I make it move, but you know, he created it, and that, that's kind of the level of collaboration. This is really a project that we've worked on completely together, and um, I appreciate all the effort that they've put into it, for sure. We have a really strong relationship with the owner, Doug Dubo, who is a, turns out to be a very crack engineer as well. Uh, been a pleasure to work with them. They're great guys. Um, we couldn't have done this without them, uh, truth told. The most exciting thing about this project for me is just the team that is together to make it. Um, number one, having Mark back in the saddle designing pinball has just been really great to see. It's been just, a, it's, it's been a, a true blessing for me to work with him again and work on this. Having Josh Sharp on the rules and Scott Pakulski doing the art. Dave doing sounds, and then and then we had Pete Petrowski doing mechanicals. He, you know, longtime Williams guy. It's just been, uh, you know, and Doug and CGC and all those guys. Um, it, that's been the funnest part about this is the team. I think we've all had a really great time. Um, you know, we're doing it out of the love for the game. We're not really in this business. We're, you know, we're just kind of doing something that we thought we wanted to offer up as, as a really great piece for people to have. So I hope you guys feel that when you, when you play it. And we're really excited about that. We're just excited for people to have this in their house and just really enjoy it. I think it's great. I think I have watched this company produce hit after hit for years. And I think there are, there is no other company that's output the quality of games that these guys have. So it's, it's really a privilege to work with them on this project. Pulp Fiction, in my experience, is one of the most unique projects. I mean, it's from a, a new group, a lot of domain experience, a lot of pinball experience, but it's the first time they've come together to make one. That's unique. This project happened and we have the people that had experience within pinball to make this project, say, say yes to an opportunity. Our core business will continue to be arcade and the ability for us to have the leader, company leadership that allows us to take on projects like this that fill an emotional need for you know the people that are on the team. I mean for me it literally like my anytime I don't spend at Roth Rolls doing work and being a bad father to my kids who swear. Is, is spent in pinball, right? Whether it's it's on the competitive side with IFPA, whether it's helping other manufacturers with rules suggestions, being able to do that for my guys at work that I that I do every day, it's it's like the dream had already come true with my day-to-day -day job. It's like overcome with emotion. All the circumstances conspired. A good client, a development game, Great license, good assets, nice sound system, uh, plenty of time to work on it. Everything came together. You know, being able to work for Mark on this project and really help help pull through his vision of the game. I mean, it, they say don't meet your heroes, and sometimes it's it's cool to meet your heroes, man. It's been so much fun to be able to do what I can to help his cause and to help the team's cause. It's been. Uh, an honor is an understatement for me.
this was awesome for me because this this worked and i think you know um my legacy would be uh next game guys i can't wait till people can get their hands on this they get it home and just play the hell out of it it's gonna be a centerpiece to anyone's collection because you know all the modern games they they're great and they, they look the same, but this is definitely something that gives you vintage vibes, but still all the modern, you know, rules and the, and the RGB lighting and stuff. And it's, it's, it's really a mix of both. And I think that's what's really gonna sell it. Yeah, I really can't wait for you guys to play it. It's gonna be awesome. There is something about this project. Everybody kind of fell in love with it. It's the first piece we've ever built where Nearly everybody on the team wants to take one home. I think you have to see it in person to appreciate the details, to see the effort, and I'm excited for people to see the product. Adding Pulp Fiction to your collection, I mean, our goal was for you, the pinball buyer, to basically be putting a piece of art in your home. When you look at it, whether the power's on or the power's off, we want this to be a great looking piece in your game room. And we think, I think we nailed it. For me, as someone who owns way too many pinball machines, what I've enjoyed as I've moved Pulp Fiction into my basement already is how when people come over, it is something that is unique and different than any other game that I have. And I have games that are 1960s EMs through Stern's, whatever, Stern's latest and greatest are also in my basement. And there is nothing else like this game in my collection. I imagine and hope that if people give it a chance, it's something that they can add to their collections that will be one of the most unique pieces that they have in the collection. So I guess I'm gonna leave you with, with this thought, you know. Get out and check out Pulp Fiction as soon as you can. It's a super fun game. There, I wouldn't fucking lie to you. It's fun. You gotta make some phone calls. You gotta call some people. Well then do it. Did that cover that, or did I go off in the weeds on that? No, all right. you just okay. perfect. I felt like I was going off in the weeds. No, no. Right. You go off in the weeds all you want. The more, the better, because I know we're going to Are you listening, Nick? Or are you, do you have headphones in? No, I'm listening. OK. So you'll know if I say anything that I'm not supposed to. <laughs> do you know what they call a quarter pound? What is it, a quarter pounder? Yeah, what, what, yeah. yeah. do you know what they what, call a quarter pounder with cheese and fries? Oh, are you, am I do, are you doing this? Yeah. Fuck, man. <laughs> okay, <purple>. holy shit. <laughs> oh. But where's Zach? Do you know what it is they call a quarter pounder with cheese in France? A Royale with cheese. There it is. There it is. Nice. 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 I like how you're taking credit for that. That's a good one. One, two. So you were, you were, uh, open to the idea. Absolutely. It, I mean, some people, they don't even know. They might think you were so damn sick and tired of pinball, you're like, I'm not doing this shit. Oh, no, I never, so. I never stopped going to shows. I never stopped paying attention. I love pinball. I mean, it's, it's part of me, you know. It always has been. Yeah. And I think George knows that, too, you know. And that made for it, a really, yes. <laughs> In a word, cool. yes. That was a mess. I didn't really like that. No, that one, you know, but I, it's fine. I'm telling it's you, fine. I don't play good. Yeah, it's fine. That was a good one. Yeah. How you feeling? Feeling good now? Yeah. But don't believe anything Josh says. <laughs> All lies. All lies. lies. Overcome with emotion, Zach. I might cry. See? I'm so excited. See, uh, you, you just shit on my question and it <laughs> turned out awesome. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the other features that you have. I mean, you talked about the topper, but you can almost list them out like this machine may feel and look initially uh, like a, a 70s machine. But you dig deeper, you get a little bit closer, we've got a state-of-the-art topper. We've got uh, a subway system, we have a buck, we have drop targets, we've got uh, custom sculpts, we have magnets, we've got, just kind of like Yeah, you did great. So I, you wanna just answer it? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I don't think I can do it that sorry, well, to be honest. I am not a salesman. So, You're a much better salesman than I am. So, uh, that, that's not <laughs> 
That was good. I like that. that see? That was good. That good. We rambled enough. Can we, you think everybody else is going to do this well? I don't know. I, I hope so. This is going to fuck up. <laughs> Who do I think is going to fuck up? Uh, it won't be Josh. Be no, George has done enough of these to be, to be good at him. It will be Scott. Thanks, Scott. You want, me to, you want to put some money on it? I'll be real soft. <laughs> <laughs> you should have got a board. <laughs> I have learned it's fucking hard to make a game. Like, what, that Nate Shivers comment of like, it, Pinball pinball's hard? It's hard, man. Oh, yes. I'm, 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 well, thank you. Yeah. It was a <laughs> thank you, just man. Being able to do that with you, so. Uh, the nerd of me. I appreciate it. You guys are like totally, <laughs> totally professional. We're not Thank too bad, sir. right? Done. I'm done. That's all I got. Feel that. I felt That's that it. one. Yeah, man. Yeah. Snap it. Look what happened? Are we? Are we? Are we starting? Are we going? They're one to five. Are we going? A plus is always good. Yes. Honestly, yeah. Done. yeah. So All right, here it is. English motherfucker. That's it. Do, That's the one. Like you just that. you just spoke See? it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> English yeah. motherfucker. Do you speak it? <laughs> one more time. Let's talk loud. Sorry. Does he look like a bitch?